What's going on here? Are we live? That's what it says. Uh, okay. Okay. Periscope just ain't working because it's Periscope and Twitter's down. But yeah, you know what? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Uh, we should probably start doing the show because we're live, huh? All right. What's up, everyone? Maybe. I'm Grant Cohn. We're all 49ers. We got Jack Hammer, Jose Sanchez, Sanchez, and Leo Luna. We got the, we got the heavy hitters today. We got to talk about the 49ers. Uh, they're two and three. Things are not looking so good, but they play the Rams this weekend. And if they win, things don't look so bad. So we got eight topics, maybe nine, probably eight that we're going to go through and uh, go around round table style. You've seen us before. I don't know who's going to start. Maybe we're going to start with Leo because he's looking handsome today. Looking, But everyone <laughs> is. Leo. No, actually, Leo, you don't get to start this one. Damn. Wait, sorry. This is for Jack <laughs> because this is Jack's topic. Uh, go away, I Leo. build this as um, the, the, the game-defining game, a defining game for Jimmy G, but that's the second topic. First topic, Jack, where are the 49ers leaders right now? Yeah, that's a, that's this is one of those questions that you actually asked all of us back uh, before, a couple weeks before the season started, and we all kind of went around, the you know, trying to trying to pick guys out. And really right now, I don't think there is one. You know, the without Staley there, you know, a lot of us had talked about Richard Sherman. Sherman's not around. He's, a, you know, he's on IR, so he's not actually on the field anymore. Uh, so at this point right now, I, I can't really say there is a leader. It, it really seems if you look at the th just the comments that you're hearing from a lot of the players, um, it, it sound, they sound like Kyle Shanahan, uh, the things that he says in, in his press conferences. Mm. You know, I just, you know, Kyle Shanahan just got off a, an interview with KMBR. They're going through the game. I have yet to hear him talk at all about the decisions he made at the end of the first half and how that affected the game. It's all about the players, what the players aren't doing right. You know, mm. we're in position, but this guy did this, this guy did that. So, you know, right now, I think they're really mirroring what their, what their, uh, what their coaches is doing. Good answer, Jack. Uh, Jose, what you got? Uh, yeah, there's definitely no leader there. It's very ugly. I think the leader would be uh, Mike McGlinchey in terms of excuses. Uh, yeah, the guy said he really – I mean, I'm gonna, in the word of Leo, they're all playing like a bunch of Tom Comptons, all right? It's, it's very bad. It's it, it's a little it's a little despicable. I don't care about you – know, like, oh, if you look at the full 60, 60 film. Well, hey, McGlinchey, you weren't – if you're going to bring up the criticism, at least be consistent and bring up when we gave you credit last year. So all of a sudden – that's the thing that very irks me. It's like you're going you're gonna to cry about, oh, they're all talking about this, my few plays. Like, well, well – yeah, when when it's when it's good, all of a sudden you don't want to you don't want to point it out. But when it when the going gets tough, all of a sudden we're the we're the ones in the wrong. Maybe you should you know ease off of Twitter a little bit. But no, there's no there's no leader there. And uh, Jack says it perfectly. Oh, they're all emulating Kyle Shanahan because that's pretty much what he's probably putting in his head. Like, hey guys, we just got to do proper execution. And it's all good. Like, why is why doesn't he just call people out? You know, I mean, I, it's not he probably doesn't even think. He, you probably may be saying it, you know, obviously one to one and wouldn't want to let us let let people know about what exactly what he's thinking. But yeah, on the nail on the head, there's no Staley like you've been saying, Grant. There's no Richard Sherman. Uh it, it, it's really bad. It's really bad. You'd think that some of these players would take some ownership, at least in their minds, but if the fact that their mentality is like, oh no, I just had some bad plays. It's like, no, it's not just some, but you guys are two and three in the easiest part of your schedule. P feel a little bit of heat on your ass and you know, feel some urgency. You do something that like actually shows that you care more than just saying, "Hey, yeah, it's just a few bad plays." That was Jose's impression of Mike McGlinchy. Mike, if you're watching, I thought that was a pretty good impression. Uh, Leo, you're up. So yeah, I think it starts with two people. It starts with Kyle Shanahan. The offense could be terrible in crucial situations, and he won't even say that he would have used a different play. Like, he can't even admit that. No, plays were fine. Sometimes I agree with you, but sometimes I'm just like, what? That was a terrible play in that situation. Kind of like the fourth and inches or fourth and one to McKinnon. Yeah, let's do a dive with our least running back that has opportunity to expand a play up the middle. Smart play. And then it goes on Jimmy Garoppolo's the second part. He's your $27 million franchise quarterback and would Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, or any of these other franchise quarterbacks been okay if they got taken out at the second half? They would have said, hell no. I don't care how bad my ankle hurts. You're playing me, coach. I am not going to go out like that. I am not going to go out 
thirty to seven at halftime. Put me in. Jimmy Garoppolo was just like, okay, where's where's the headphones? Give me the clipboard. I, I'll take my L. Okay, you guys have all had very good answers, very strong answers. I'm going to be the soft one here. The original question was, where are the 49ers leaders? And I'm going to say they're just, they're not on the team. And it's not the player's fault. It's, it's, it's the roster construction. There are no good players. There's one good player. There's only one good player in his 30s on this team. And it's Trent Williams, unless I'm forgetting someone. That's the only good player in his 30s. The only good player who's been around the block and understands what a good season looks like, what a bad season looks like, the kind of stuff that Richard Sherman and Joe Staley have. I mean, Trent Williams needs to be the leader, but apparently he ain't one. I don't know if he was one in Washington. He's been on a lot of bad teams. He just doesn't seem to be a leader. So just now, George Kittle was talking. He, he was doing his weekly press conference, and he was being very like confessional and saying, look, like losing Joe Staley really hurt. And he, I'll explain why. It's like he, he didn't just hold the offensive lineman accountable. He held Jimmy accountable. He held defensive players accountable. And what, what George was saying is like, look, uh, you know, I want to do that. I'm trying to do that, but it's my fourth year in the league. I don't have the same type of perspective that Joe Staley had. And so what I'm doing is I'm talking to Joe every day and Joe's doing everything he can to, to tutor me as a leader, which I think is just the cutest thing in the world. Like Niners helping Niners, like Joe Staley is still totally bought into this team, even though they're not paying him and he's not on it. It's like, he's seeing it from the, from the sidelines and like, God, if I could only help, but he's not on the team anymore. He can't lead it from his couch, wherever he lives. So I think it's like George is trying, but he acknowledges like the best players on the team right now are like 24, 25, 26, Fred Warner, George Kittle. There's only so much leading they can do. They really need Richard Sherman to come back. And I don't know if he will. You know what the answer is, Grant? What? Uh, they need to trade for the only former 49er who can hold all these guys accountable for a team that ha needs to fire sale. They need to Frank trade Gore. Frank Gore. Get him on T so he can be that leader, man. All you need to do is give him a few touches and he's going to get that nice little bulky six-yard carry. And then he's going to be like, that's how you, that's how you leave, baby. He's going to get all those full spaces. <laughs> and that's how, I, hey, you know, we throw him a seventh rounder. Throw him a sandwich. I think pretty sure Adam Gase will take it. Throw him a sandwich. Well, they just lost Le'Veon Bell. Now they need – Frank Gore is going to go for 2,000 yards this year on the Jets. Watch. <laughs> you just watch. Okay, let's move on now to Jimmy G. Um, what's at stake for him this Sunday? Uh, is, is this a, a career-defining game? Is, oh, is this a defining moment for him? Leo, you start. I don't think it, his career is at stake just because my theory is they're going to run the hell out of hmm. the ball. So – Right. Um, but it is, his future is at, at the tipping point for the 49ers because it, you can't do that against a Dolphins team, a Cardinals team, and then, you know, S the bed against the Rams. Again, it, he's out of excuses, especially after what happened to the Super Bowl. It, it's at the point to where he's a liability in the pocket. He seems to have jittery feet in the pocket. Um, he's not using his legs to throw the ball at all, so that's why you see a lot of balls just completely inaccurate. Um, there's questions when it comes to Jimmy Garoppolo's future with this team, and that contract extension that can make things lighter for the cap next year, it it's in question right now. Hmm. Uh, not his career, not his NFL career, but his 49ers career is definitely going to be a toss-up if he goes out and even sniffs the performance he did against the Cardinals or especially the Dolphins because this is there's so many multiple reasons you can get into. Number one, the season's on the line for the playoff race. Number two, it's a divisional game. Number three, you know the Rams are going to come and bring it because you're the one that put the tombstone pile driver on the Rams in week 16. And guess what? It's week six. It's already week six. And the Rams can do the same thing to you, and they have all the momentum in the world. You don't. You're coming off the worst game in the Kyle Shanahan era. Jimmy Garoppolo's coming off arguably his worst game of all time. So now you have such a huge turnaround. Aaron Donald's in front of you. Uh, you know, this is going to be a defining moment. How are you going to respond? And, you know, Leo, me and you got, on, got into it already. Garoppolo probably shouldn't have been benched in that second half because he's an in-rhythm passer. Now you're going to want him just all of a sudden just light it up out of nowhere against a Good ass defensive front like Aaron Donald and all those people. Oh my! It, I don't. I have no faith that he's going to be able to step up in this situation uh, because our offensive line. You know, he just didn't have no confidence at all, and he's just. And all it takes is for one hit for him to get that little shaky feet. That's it. So, it, but if he balls out, if he balls out, 
then all of a sudden we're going to stave off that it for temporarily and see how he comes back. But if he does, if he does have anywhere, if they lose and he's a part of the reason why Shanahan, I mean, the fact that Shanahan said, Hey, I have no issue pulling him again. You already know his patience thin. So Jimmy, this is a defining moment for your 49ers career. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a defining moment for for Garoppolo. Definitely, he's got to come out and have a, a good game this week uh, if he's going to you know be expected to be the leader. You know, last year when they first played the Rams down in L.A., I thought he played really well. He was getting hit, you know, knocked around. It was a really rough first half, and and he was able to make some throws. It's going to be interesting this week, really, to see how they perform. That you know that offensive line is so bad. It's, it's really throws a, a monkey wrench into their whole their whole mm. game. It you really know, does. They, they fit the they fit the quarterback fifty times already in, through five games this year, and uh, it, it's they it goes far deeper than the quarterback, even though that's going to be the scapegoat. Wait, Jack, yeah. but have you been watching all sixty minutes of Michael Glinchy's games? He's actually been playing better than what you're giving him credit for. Well, that's the problem. I have watched it. And that's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's what I got to say about Jimmy G. Um, if he has another stinker, it's very concerning, and it's starting to look like he's on the way out in San Francisco. If he plays well. If he beats the Rams and plays well on, on national television, he's kind of like absolved of his sins of the last, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, it's he can really erase all of that narrative with just one good game. But what, I want to put things in perspective with Garoppolo. Like, are we really expecting him to have a really good game? And, I and I'll ask it this way. When was the last time he had a good game? To me, he week played 17. great. Yes. He played great week 16 and week 17. I mean, week 16 – he made two huge big time throws under pressure to beat the Rams in the fourth quarter, like third and a million twice. That was amazing. And then the next the week, same he drive. Went, yeah. And, and then the next week, he went to Seattle and won in Seattle, which is never easy. I mean, those were two games that he should be building confidence from. Then he goes in the playoffs and has a shaky game against the Vikings. And then the next game, I would say that Kyle Shanahan humiliated him by calling only eight passes. Had he called 16? Nothing humiliating about that. That's a Ryan Tannehill game. But eight, that was tough. And so the, he had to spend the entire week before the Super Bowl saying, answering the question, do you think Kyle Shanahan trusts you? Uh, and the question's about Tom Brady. And that stunk. And then he crumbled in the Super Bowl. He crumbled week one. He got hurt week two. He crumbled week five. So I'd like to see him have one good game. And I think a lot of it is mental and not about his knee or his ankle, but it's about the NFC Championship game. That was a huge game. And he was really, um, what's the word? Shanahan humiliated him. I don't think you get over that. Eight passes. So that's the way I see it. Um, I'd like to see him get some confidence, play the way he played the last time he played the Rams. If he plays like that, then the Niners have a quarterback. Next question. Yeah, I like. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I like Garoppolo. I, I like Garoppolo, and I'd like to see him start playing like that 2017 Garoppolo all over again. Um, but if not, if they don't make the playoffs or if they don't finish above 500, it, it's in jeopardy because you look at any other team, if they have an offensive personnel like the 49ers currently have, well, I'm not talking, I'm not going to get into the offensive line, but his weapons as far as receiving and rushing, mm -hmm. what top 15 quarterback does not make the playoffs and at least drive their team to 30 points a game? They're struggling just to get to 24 right now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, if, is there any scenario in which the 49ers trade Jimmy Garoppolo by the deadline? Like, say, let's say they get blown out this weekend at home again and go on a losing streak and the season just gets bleak. Um, is there any worst, not worst case, any scenario where they trade this guy uh, before the deadline? No. Um, <laughs> go ahead. I no, no, no. So. Okay. End of story. <laughs> no, I don't really. Think so. really? Okay. Uh, just, just because I don't think they're going to get enough for for him to do that, I, you know, I don't, I don't see a team with the way that he's playing. Where's he going to go? That's going to give him more than you know, maybe a third round pick uh, for Garoppolo. Really, when you think about it, where's he going to go? Oh, oh, okay. Hold on. Since you guys all say no, let me, let me, let me stick with this for a second. Um, what if he goes to New England? You don't think New England would want him? I was going to bring that up. <laughs> I mean, would New England not offer a third for him? And would the Niners not take that if they want, if they've decided they want to move on and they have someone else that they could get at the deadline? Because some guys lost, might be. 
if they lost every game before going up to the deadline, then I would definitely entertain that. But why would if, if they lost three games in a row, I don't think right. New England would offer third, knowing Belichick, he'd be like, Hey, you know, remember how we got a second for you? Here's a six, take it for you at six or fifth or something like that. Just because like if, if they lost three games in a row, that that definitely means Garoppolo was a reason why they lost that game. They wasn't able just to keep him alive. And if he's not, it's because he's benched or for whatever reason. Um but yeah, that'd probably be the only reason why it probably be more than five. Like probably what you were going to hop on Grant just because Belichick just knows him and he liked him and he really wanted to keep him instead of instead of Brady. But yeah, that's honestly like the only one I can entertain. Even then, I still think it's a little bit of a touch, a tough stretch to imagine. The only way I can see New England wanting to make that kind of a deal is if they go on a losing streak here. Otherwise, I think they really like what Cam Newton brings to the table for him uh, with Newton. the ability to, to run and throw. That's something that McDaniel's has likes in his quarterbacks. He showed that when he was the head coach in Denver, when he, when he uh, brought in Tebow, that he was looking for that kind of a, a quarterback and, and Newton's, you know, far and away better than Tebow ever was. And then Newton's going to keep the ball more because he runs it and he will drain the clock and keep the time of possession longer. So keeping the defense a little bit more fresh, which I'm sure Belichick will appreciate more, but I'd say if they cut it ties with him, you know, versus a trade, but at that point we're just spitballing. I don't know. They they developed Jimmy Garoppolo. He's he's a patriot, and they could look at this situation and be like, well, uh, you know, maybe that's maybe he's not being maybe the scheme doesn't fit him. Maybe the supporting cast doesn't fit him. Maybe Kyle Shanahan's style of coaching isn't good for him. I mean, we've seen Kyle Shanahan's very hard on on coaches, on players, and I, it doesn't seem like Jimmy Garoppolo has the confidence he used to have. Maybe if Bill Belichick feels like, hey, if I trade for him. And if Bill Belichick says, Jimmy, you're great. Jimmy, don't worry what Kyle said. Jimmy, I think you're the best. That That's the kind of coaching he needs. I don't know. I think that just because he's have, having a, a rough few games with the Niners doesn't necessarily mean that the Patriots would change their opinion of him. Um, but maybe this is this is a dumb theoretical that, that there's a possibility the Niners would trade this guy. It just seems like, look, if, if Leo, if uh, – <laughs> They're going to move on from him at the end of the year. If like this season goes real south and they realize that there's nothing Jimmy can do and it's not going to work out for him here, then why wait? If you're like, well, we're going to cut him at the end of the year or we're going to trade him at the end of the year because we know we can move on. His contract is structured a certain way. Like, why not just do it now? Move on now. Uh, get something from the Patriots and see what you have from other players. Maybe trade for another quarterback. Uh, it just seems like if they go on this losing streak and they've decided internally Jimmy's not the guy for us, why wait? But that's like eight theoreticals down the line. So let's go to another yeah. theoretical. I didn't, I didn't get to talk about it. Oh, my bad, Leo. Go ahead. <laughs> my bad, my bad. So I was going to say, before the trade deadline, absolutely not. Because although Shanahan may be disappointed in Jimmy Garoppolo, that's not Shanahan's guy. This is John Lynch's guy. Yep. So John Lynch is not going to give up on Jimmy Garoppolo so soon because he's the one who looked like a genius for getting Garoppolo for only a second round pick. So John Lynch is going to try to strain any little thing out of Jimmy Garoppolo until they make that decision. And that decision is not going to come before the trade deadline. And he's going to try to get something to still look as that genius he did when he got Garoppolo. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, the trade deadline is November 3rd. So it's, they don't got a lot of time. It's not like they're going to go on an eight game losing streak in the next 17 days. So, Good point. Probably not going to happen. Um, but I want to go to another hypothetical. I'm not the only one who brought this up. Someone, Dominique Foxworth on ESPN brought it. I think a lot of people kind of putting the connecting the dots here. It's obvious. I mean, the, the Falcons are going to rebuild. They're going to get a new coach. Matt Ryan's old. He's expensive. Um, it's highly likely that the new coach will say, I'd rather draft a quarterback, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence, then try to make it work with this expensive old quarterback who doesn't move so well. Um, and so in, if that's, if that's, if we agree on that, would a Kyle Shanahan, Matt Ryan reunion in 2021 be beneficial and make sense for both sides? Absolutely. Um, that was Matt Ryan's MVP year um, and never really, Never got to a conference championship again. Got to the playoffs, but never got to a conference championship game again. And with the 49ers weapons they have, Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, Raheem Moster, it absolutely makes sense for Matt Ryan. And then when you look at the makeup of the two quarterbacks between Garoppolo and Matt Ryan, Matt Ryan's like, like it's not even a question who's the better quarterback. So 
that's if the 49ers are getting rid of Garoppolo, it's going to be for an improvement. It's not going right. to be for a project. And Matt Ryan is definitely an improvement, as you've spoken plenty of times. The Shanahan's like older veteran yeah. quarterbacks. And that's, I think it's a perfect move for both parties. Jose. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, I've been back and forth on it, but I, I, it's definitely something that I can envision Shanahan doing. I don't think they should do it, but it's, you know, just think of his mind. He's going to be like, Oh, Hey, Matt Ryan's available. Come on down, man. Cause we, we needed to take advantage of this window we have now. And I, and especially if depending on how this season goes, if Garoppolo is still like similar to what we've been seeing this season so far from him, that he's going to be absolutely with zero patience, extremely pissed, and he's going to be like, hey, I just pretty much wasted a year because of poor quarterback play. I need someone I can trust. He, he's obviously on the downward slope of his career, but at least he's, he's still – I still think he's probably a better passer than Garoppolo right now. And so yeah. he figures probably, yeah, let's go for it. Um, so, yeah, I definitely can envision that happening just for he wanted. I don't think that that's the route they should take, but, you know, sh- knowing Shanahan and this weird quarterback – like infatuations, you know, Kirk Cousins, all this such, so on and so forth. I love CJ Beathard. You know, I definitely can envision that happening. Yeah. I, I could see, I could see Ryan being uh, attractive to, uh, to Shanahan. I, my, my thing is uh, I'd be a little nervous with him uh, back there. He doesn't move very well. Um, and, and I think really the direction and, you know, a lot of people have been pointing this out is, is the need to have quarterbacks that can move around, even, you know, uh, be able to get outside the pocket, make some plays. Uh, is Ryan still really able to do those kind of things and, and, and avoid the rush that he'd be facing here? That's a good point. Uh, I don't think he ever really has been able to do that. I mean, he's not a complete statue like Philip Rivers, but he's close to it. And he did have his most success with Kyle Shanahan. You could argue Shanahan had his most success with Matt Ryan. Um, so to me, I think it would make sense. And another way it would make sense, we just talked about how this Niners team has no veteran leadership. Zero. Matt Ryan is kind of like the ultimate veteran leader. And not only that, he's Mike McGlinchey's first cousin. So he'll get Mike McGlinchey hitting his weight, playing better. He'll hold him accountable. I mean, I actually think Matt Ryan could have like a Joe Staley effect on the team. I mean, it seems like that's been his reputation. I've never covered Matt Ryan. I don't know if he's uh, a fraud or if he's the real deal like Staley is, but I I think actually he would be much more of a leader than Jimmy Garoppolo is right now. It's hard to lead when you're in and out of the lineup. And it's clear that your head coach doesn't even trust you. And when things go bad, takes the ball out of your hands. I mean, how do you lead when you're undercut every step of the way from Kyle Shanahan? I mean, I don't think Shanahan can't do that to Matt Ryan as much. Uh, my dad is calling me right now. Dad, I'll call you later. I'm sorry. I love you. Um, so, yeah, I think it does sorry. make sense. The one thing is, though, Uh, If it were me, like Jack said, like you wouldn't want to bring in an expensive old quarterback who can't move. I've been watching highlights of this Trey Lance kid. I like that guy. I like him a lot. Um, And the thing I like about him, he actually has experience under center doing play action passes, bootlegs, rollouts, turning his back to the defense. Now, all of his receivers are wide open all the time because he plays at North Dakota State. But say that was the same thing for Carson Wentz, Steve McNair. It's okay. I, I just like his athleticism, and I think he actually would be fantastic in this offense. I don't know if Shanahan has any uh, desire to coach him up. I don't know if he could play right away, but have you guys seen him? I haven't seen him yet. I was going to get to it. Well, now that he Because he pretty much already opted out for the season, right? He's working on the draft. Check out Trey Lance. All right, let's move on. Um, what's going to happen with Dante Pettis? He got deactivated last week. Everyone was kind of like, hey, man, the comeback's going to happen eventually. It's going to happen eventually. It's starting to look like it won't. But the Niners won't make up their mind. They won't trade him. They won't cut him. He's just inactive. What is, What does the future hold for Dante Pettis? There's no reason for him to be here. They're not using him at all. He's not touching the ball. He hasn't touched the ball for two years. He just kind of started <laughs> taking up a space. You know, other than a punt return, I think he caught maybe, a, you know, that's about all you see, you know, going out there and, and swimming with uh, with Mostert after his touchdown the, the season opener. But other than that, he, he's there's no there's nowhere for him on this roster, and uh, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense that they just kind of keep him around. Yeah, his future is going to be on Cake Boss. He's going to be on there somewhere, and it's going to be representative of how soft he is because it's just, I mean, I, I it's like I just can't believe the guy who we were seeing in training camp just is like. 
Uh, he just I, I'm not sure exactly what he got pissed off about this season, at least Kyle Shannon. Maybe it's because he didn't dive for the ball, didn't try throwing his heart, even though that was a bad throw. But I mean, yeah, it's what are you doing with him at this point? I mean, everyone summed it up perfectly of the fans for once about you let Sanu go, but Pettis is like inactive. So what are you what are you doing here? Where's the where's the sense making at least Sanu someone you can plug in from here and there? I mean, I, I don't know what he's doing. I just think he wants to keep him so he can save face in a way versus just cut him and just absolutely just say, hey, look, I, I busted on this pick. So I, I think it's that point. It's just to save face. Troll comment of the day. Sorry. Good answer. That was a good answer. Sorry. Good answer. <laughs> Leo. Yeah, I, I saw a hypothetical trade uh, from ESPN where it was packaging Dante Pettis and a fifth Who's for Ryan him? Kerrigan. That's his future. They're not gonna take That's that. his future, though. Being packaged in a trade. Somebody will because it's the NFL. He didn't work in that offense because he's not in my offense. Um, it happens all the time, and that's his future. Being a packaged with a late-round pick. That's Dante Pettis. That's uh, optimistic. I, That's to very me, optimistic. It's, I think, it's like his work ethic, too. Yeah, I, to me, I think he has about as much trade value as Solomon Thomas. Uh, which is zilch. I could be wrong. I don't Thomas know. Thomas has more. Really? I don't I know. Think so. Maybe. I, think <laughs> I don't know. To, to me, he's going to continue to hang around on this roster the way Solomon Thomas did. I mean, Solomon Thomas, you see Kevin Givens right now. He, Solomon Thomas isn't half the player Kevin Givens is. And Thomas was getting reps over him last year. Uh, yeah. I just think he's a goner. You know? Bye-bye. You know? bye. Pettis, but so he'll he'll hang around on the on the on the, on the roster. He'll be he'll be inactive, but they won't cut him. They'll just let him stay there, and they won't make up their mind. They'll just kind of like play it both ways, which is weak. Cut him today. If they cut him today, I would respect him more. Be like, nice. They made up their mind. They they admitted a mistake and they moved on. But this is like we know he's not going anywhere. But we're just gonna hang on to him so we don't have to acknowledge and have people write articles. It's like I don't know. Go for it. You can do it. I give you permission. All right. Um, are the Niners better without Quan Alexander? Oh, no. In this way. Uh, yeah, you could start Greenlaw at the will and Quan at the Sam. They're better in that way. Fair but enough. without Quan Alexander, that means you're starting Al Shazier, who is Not nowhere. Yeah. yeah, in coverage. In the run game, even with Quan's mixed tackles, he's he's nowhere near that level. So um, they're better without his contract for sure. But <laughs> as far as the three linebacking starting three linebackers, no, they're not better without him. No, yeah, he, they're not better without him. Um, it's just mainly. I'll tell to another point. Not only because you keep Shahir off the off the field. But because now if they want – if Robert Sala wants that flexibility of going more skewed towards base defense more often than he likes, then, you know, you're not going to be like, hey, Al here, you want to cover? Because, <laughs> you know, at least Quan isn't the coverage linebacker that he was prior to his torn peck. But at least, you know, he's like somewhat capable out there. So if you want to just stay in the base and if an offense wants to threaten pass def- – there and pass at least you know you have three capable pass defending linebackers out there and who can also support in the run so no i don't think they're better by any chance and like leo said like hey if he's up greenlaw's obvious upgraded alexander and hopefully eventually realize that with this injury with the second injury in the second year shocker Quan alexander with another injury um but yeah the, 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 no no way no way they're better they're not better without Alexander being in the starting lineup. They're better if they replace Alexander in the in the nickel with with Greenlaw, though. Yes, uh, he's he's and that's the, uh, a defense that they play a lot because of the way the NFL is nowadays. He's a much better overall linebacker than Greenlaw uh, than uh, Quan Quan is at this point, and so he should definitely be in you know in that second linebacker role. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say they are better without Quan because obviously they're not. I mean, you need depth, and they've just lost depth, and they're. Uh, thin already, but they're better without Quan because it forces them not to play him in the nickel defense, and it forces them to play Dre Greenlaw in the nickel defense. Uh, and nickel is what you play most of the time, so um, it they will. The, the end result is that they will be a better defense without him, even though they should have been able to make this adjustment while he was on the team. Um, so yeah, I really think that. It, it was interesting. 
Sala gave a whole, Robert Sala gave a whole description of the difference between Dre Greenlaw and Quan Alexander today. And he loves Quan Alexander. He says, you know, Quan, he's so instinctual that he knows when to cheat and when to not follow the rules of the defense. And he's been getting better at when to do that. And Dre Greenlaw is more by the book. You know what? Give me by the book. I don't like Quan Alexander's instincts or his feelings. <laughs> I feel like he gets it wrong most of the time. Just give me Dre Greenlaw, who's a really good athlete who does his job correctly. Give me Dre. And plus, Why Dre can't... makes more plays. So, I mean, I don't think the uh, the uh, Quan, hey, like Quan cheats, and it's like he just knows. But it's like, all right, it's great you know. But Dre plays it by the book, and he just knows his instincts by the book gets him the plays he makes. So that's why he got his nickname. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Quan needs to start cheating towards the flat. Because I don't know how many touchdowns this defense is going to give up <laughs> while Quan is covering the flat. You saw it in Miami's Dolphins game. I think we saw it in the Eagles game, too. Yeah, you're right. When they got to the three-yard line, they went right after Quan Alexander in the flat, and he was late getting out there. Good eye. All right. Now let's get into the particulars of the game, the matchups to watch, and some predictions. So let's start off with the, the Niners' defense against the Rams' offense. Everyone pick a matchup from that matchup that you think is critical to the outcome of this game? Oof. I think it's going to be Jamar Taylor. Uh, they're going to have opportunities to get the Rams off the field. Um, so those third downs, they love drawing it up to the slot wide receiver. We saw last year when Jimmy Ward stopped them a couple times on going to Cooper Cup out of the slot. And that's where it's going to come from to – if you want to get the Rams off the field. So Jamar Taylor, I'm interested to see if he has a comeback game because he, he did have that interception from the Dolphins right there, but he stopped running. Hmm. That's a good one. I was actually going to consider that too, but now, now you stole it. I mean, I, I'm trying to avoid the, oh, the key match of Aaron Donald because I, I don't think there is, I have no way of inclination, any indication, anything that I think they're going to slow him down. I think he's going to feast. And this guy had four sacks last week. So no, I think, I think the key matchup here is going to have to be at least at least the safeties. You know, at least the safeties in terms of coming up against the run and coming up for those slot receivers, like giving support to, Jamon Ta to Jamar Taylor. I know it's more than just like giving adjustments to help, but those receivers, Cooper Cup and Robert Woods, man, that's like one of that's uh, that's one of the best wide receiver duos. I was going to give them the best wide receiver duos, but that's one of the best out there just because they're so interchangeable. And at least so Tart, Tart and Ward, they both like to come up and play the box. They need to play. They need to be on their a game because these guys can dust them and make sure you're not taking the wrong angles once they get once they get those yak so they really need to be on their toes because you know i think taylor's going to get beat at times i think mcveigh is going to scheme them up to find them open so i think those are going to be the last line of defense we're going to see a lot of those chunk plays i think the rams so those safety plays are going to is going to be very key and crucial presenting big plays yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how the Rams attack the 49ers. They, they did two different things against them last year. And the first game was a lot of drop back and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't very successful with it. And they came back in that second game at Levi's. And and it was play action left, play action right. And really gave the 49ers fit in the second half. And they adjusted. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Robert Sala does adjust everybody. He did it in that game. And that's why he, he did. was able to come yep. back. You know, uh, it's a great adjustment. You know, and, and, and not only that, but you had, uh, I think it was Greenlaw. Or no, excuse me. It was uh, 54. Get the pick six right before halftime. That's really mm -hmm. what kind of, you know fed oh, into yeah, that, that comeback. Oh, so oh, yeah. you know, I, I'm not going to say any one any. I can like you know pick any one position group, but just really interesting to see how the the uh, Rams are going to attack this defense. So I, no, that's a good one. McVeigh against Robert Sala. It was a terrific matchup. Week 16 last week uh, last year. Mm -hmm. McVeigh's game plan was brilliant, and Robert Sala's adjustments were effective and timely i'm gonna go with i have a couple first of all you said jamar taylor against cooper cup that's a really good one it shouldn't be jamar taylor versus cooper cup that's an that's look no offense to your friend um or you're not who uh i thought jamar taylor was arguably as bad as brian allen in that game it's just brian allen's plays were a little bit more obvious but jamar taylor is struggling and if he has to go against cooper cup man to man that's just not a matchup he can win consistently so i think what the niners need to do is, is be prepared for Jamar Taylor to have some serious problems early in the game and have a backup plan. You know, I, I wouldn't even start him. To me, all the not, the, the Rams receivers are slot guys, just like the mm -hmm. Niners. And against them, you need to have your best corners in the slot. So either Verrett or Mosley needs to go in the slot, uh, and you need to bring in w Witherspoon and play him outside. 
I would go those three. If they have Jamar Taylor as one of their three, then the Niners, I don't know if they're going to win this game. So I, I think they need to have Mosley in the slot. Last year when they would play against the Rams, they would have J- uh, Jimmy Ward drop down in the slot. They got to do something. Um, because again, Jamar Taylor, like he's been on the team for a week and a half. It's a lot to ask. Uh, and then another one, how about Javon Kinlaw versus Austin Corbett? Okay. Kinlaw's having, we've praised him a lot and we've given him some props, but the dude still hasn't got a sack. And I think he has one quarterback hit or zero. So this would be a great week for him to get off the schneid and to get his first career sack. He's going against a guy, Austin Corbett, who's just a guy. He's no, he's nothing special. Former second round pick, but he's not that good. Javon Kinlaw should be physically superior to him. Kinlaw, step up. Uh, they they could really use it. You're not you're not like it's not like you're behind schedule, but they sure could use it because the only way they're getting any pressure right now is from blitzes from Fred Warner and Jamar Taylor. So Kinlaw, it'd be nice to see that from him. And Goff doesn't so, move. And Goff doesn't move. So Javon, you can have a big game today. You're going against, you know. A mediocre guard and you're and, and a and a quarterback who doesn't move. Let's go to the other side of the ball. The Niners offense against the Rams defense, which is a hell of a defense. I don't know how much you guys have watched of it. There's a new defensive coordinator who is a Vic Fangio disciple, and the structure of the defense looks exactly like those Harbaugh defenses from eight, nine years ago. So pick a matchup from that side of the ball. Um, it can be players, it can be coaches. Um, you guys pick. Jack. Good, buddy. Yep. I'll go. Uh, I, I really the 49ers really need to be able to run the ball. So I want to see I want to see Raheem, Raheem Mostert uh, attack this Rams defense. I want to see what they can do. Get him downhill. Uh, get him out. You know, get him downhill. Get him some. He does seem to be run really well on those toss sweeps as well. Uh, try to try to make the, these def, these Rams guys run sideline to sideline. Uh, try to wear them out. Try to do that early and often throughout the first half of the game. So in the second half, if you're still if it's still close, you have a chance. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to go a little bit similar. Just say 49ers offensive line against the defensive line. I mean, obviously, you know, Donald. But I just think it's – I just think what's going to be key is like exactly what Jack said, those stretch runs, toss plays. You really have to rely on Mosert to get Garoppolo comfortable and allow to play action, boots, all that. So that way the Rams defense is second-guessing what they're doing because you don't want to get in a similar scenario. It was like, great, now you're already down. You didn't give the defense enough time to even to even rest or anything and now you're in a you're in a position where you're forced to come back and i don't think the offense is really built like that so yeah i want to see more most dirt you know hopefully we we'll see maybe even see some jermichael hasty why not throw him out there because he might seem good because i think jeff wilson was working out there um that's probably that's the best combo in my opinion see most and hasty out there because the vision and at least the way how they just seeing how they're allowed quickness. So offense, four nines offensive line, you're not going to get much between the tackles. I just think going horizontal is the way they go. All right. So Kyle Shanahan versus Kyle ah, I like Shanahan. that. Ah, I like that. It, it versus himself. Like, he's got to run the ball. If they have a, any shot to win, it's got to be 35 yeah. times this game. Um, he said – that the lack of the running the ball was because of the scores, uh, the games, the game flow. Well, the Eagles game was a one score game throughout all four quarters, and you ran the ball 20 times with. Preach, preach. Yeah. <laughs> you ran the ball 20 times. That there's, it's a one score game. Like, what, what excuse are you using against that game? And then they're rushing the ball at a higher rate this year at five yards an average compared to 4.6 last year, which got them second best in the NFL. And last year, so back-to-back games, 20 20 attempts, 19 attempts. The only time Shanahan ran the ball for 20 attempts last year was once in 16 games. Less he just 20. did it back-to-back. Yeah. 20, 20 yeah. like the, he did it 20 times. Okay. Or a game only once. Okay. And so everything else has been more than 20 last season. 15 other games. He went back-to-back weeks with 20 and 19. Bad. I love that answer. Shanahan against himself. That's the answer of the day so far. I wish I had thought of it. Uh, <laughs> look, yes, the game is going to come down to the Niners run game. They are efficient on the ground. And I'm telling you, this Rams defense is really good. The only weakness they seem to have is the run defense technically. And some, and they actually, I think, held Washington to like 30 rushing yards last week. I think they gave up 108 total yards. It's a really good defense. But – so what you got to know about it, this new defensive coordinator is using Ramsey differently. He's in the slot a lot. 
He used to be an outside corner. Now he's in the middle of the action. And I think he's going to be covering Kittle all game, which means, which is good news for the Niners run game because Kittle can block him, but it's bad news for the Niners passing game. Ramsey is, I think he's given up 11 catches on 23 targets this year. He's great. And as good as Kittle is, he's not the greatest route runner. I, so that means if they're going to have any success in the air, and it's important that they throw the ball a little or else they're not going to be on the run, run the ball enough. Um, they, they need the two young wide receivers, Ayuk and Debo, to have success against Troy Hill and D- Darius Williams. Uh, those guys are pretty good. It's a really good defense. It's a good pass rush. But if those two young wide receivers step up, uh, then the Niners should win this game. So I, I'm curious to see what the young wide receivers can do because so far they haven't played that well. And what, what just now, about an hour ago, I asked George Kittle, why are you confident this team can turn it around and make the playoffs he eventually got to, um, well, we're relying heavily on two young starting wide receivers and they should just get better as the season goes on. So they could use uh, a, a jump this week from those two. And I'm, I'm curious to see it because they're not going against Xavier Howard and Byron Jones. They're going against Troy Hill and Darius Williams, who are playing well, but they're Troy Hill and Darius Williams. So let's let's see it, guys. Yeah, it'll happen once Jimmy Garoppolo sees the throwing windows. Yeah, because uh, the way they're covering Kittle, he has a zone wide open if Jimmy holds the ball for literally a half a second more. But what he's doing, it this is what Steve Young alluded to on KNBR. He looks at George Kittle. He goes, he's covered, looks off George Kittle. Um, instead, if he just stayed on Kittle, waits that half second, and he finds that throwing window, or by looking around so much and jumping from receiver to receiver, you often find yourself throwing the ball late. And that's what happened with the Dolphins and that Xavier Howard took advantage. Real quick, what you said about Shanahan against himself, what I'd like to see from Shanahan is like, remember that first drive from the Rams against the Niners last year uh, in LA where the Rams just ran the ball eight times and scored a touchdown? I'd like to see the Niners do that. How about an entire opening drive with just runs, like the entire array, end arounds, reverses, jet sweeps, shock and awe on the ground, establish your running game. Why not? They can do it. Get Ayuk a touch on the first drive. Get Debo with Samuel a touch on the first drive. And let Ayuk return punts. My goodness, Cooper Cup returns punts for the for the Rams. I mean, what is why is what is Kyle Shanahan afraid of? What's gonna happen on this punt return that's so dangerous? Get him the ball. Raheem Mostert, too. Last topic before we go. Pick a winner this weekend. If you think the Niners are gonna win, how can you justify that? based on how the Niners have played the last two weeks. I mean, they lost to the Eagles and the Dolphins. And now you're going to tell me with a straight face they're going to beat the 4-1 Rams? Really? Justify that. Or tell me why the Niners are going to get smoked. So I'm going to be that guy. Niners win. Niners win because Kyle Shanahan feels the pressure from running the ball. You you pressured him on running the ball as well. Uh, <laughs> He's going to do it. They're going to have success with it because the Rams are not good. Um, last week, they got a little help because Antonio Gibson's not that good of a running back. Right. Um, so they're going to do, they have Raheem Mostert. Uh, McKinnon has done okay as far as running the ball. They have Debo. They have Ayuk to do the end of rounds. Running, run the ball 35 times. I think they can come out with the victory. I, I kind of want to say the Rams, but I just, it's just hard for me to see a three-game losing streak by the 49ers season, 100% on the line. I know it's the Rams. I know, and it won't shock me if the Rams beat them. Hell, it wouldn't shock me if they blow them out. Yeah. But it's yeah. still – it is a desperation win. These guys are suffocating, and a team who's desperate back against the wall, they have to – you know, if they lose this game – then I'm gonna I'm gonna kill them. I'm gonna kill them harder than you will, Grant, because it's like you you your your back's against the wall. You're, if the only way is you lose because you came out flat. But if they fight, I, I just figure they have to fight. He has to realize I have Moster. We gotta run the ball. You know, I know they have Donald, but running the ball worked well against them in a week six. This time, wait, they did play in week six last time as well, I think, or whatever in week six. And weeks, you know, he needs to do that. Get horizontal as well with the jet, jet sweeps that you're saying. Get Ayuka involved. Get Debo involved. Do everything. Just don't make it a heavy passing situation because for some reason Kyle Shanahan loves to pass the ball. He did it against the Cardinals. He did it like Leo said right now. The Eagles, you had like Mullins and you're over here throwing it like a million times. Like, what are you doing? So, sure you guys to start the game. I'll never forget <laughs> that. I will never forget that. 
Jack was right, though. He still should have made that pass. He still should have made oh, that yeah, pass. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For sure, for sure, for sure. <laughs> but, but no, yeah, it, it's hard. It's going to be a close one. It's going to be a close one. I could see it being like a 27-24 type of battle. Dude, the Rams' defense is not giving up 27 or 24 points. I'm telling you. They gave it up to the to Buffalo, but this defense hasn't given up mo more than 20 in any other game this season. So you're wrong. Jack, you're up. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. It's the visional game, man. It always comes. It always comes. Oh, you're, right. you're right. You're and right. And they're familiar. All right. All right. The, the only part of me that sees the 49ers being able to win this game is when you look at who the Rams have beaten. The Rams have, have played the NFC East. That's their wins. Those are their four wins, and then they, they lost to Buffalo. So that's the one That's the one thing you can kind of hang your hat on and, and give you a little bit of glimmer of hope. Uh, the other side of that, though, is Sean McVay really doesn't seem to like the 49ers, especially when they play at Levi's. They play, He's faced them three times so far, the, the Rams. The 49ers have not been able to hold him under 30 points in any of the first the three games since McVay took over in 2017. The Rams point. have averaged 37 points a game. So – it's it's going to be a really tough one to see this defense be able to hold hold the Rams under you know twenty points. Oof. which I think is what it would take to to do. But hey, yeah. you know the Giants did it. That's what I want to say. Let me make the case for why the Niners can do this. The Rams struggled against the Giants. Um, they didn't struggle against the Eagles, so that's a whole different thing. But they did struggle against the Giants. Uh, so there's that. There's, they they have a vulnerable run defense. The Niners, a big reason they lost last week is because they played Brian Allen. Um, they're not going to do that this week. If Emmanuel Mosley comes back and they have a, a plan in the slot that doesn't include, include Jamar Taylor, sorry, Jamar, their defense still should be good. I mean, I think when they have not Jamar Taylor and Brian Allen on the field, sorry, guys, uh, they're a top 10 defense in the league. And I'm not that impressed with the Rams offense. I mean, they've put up good numbers so far, but none of their running backs, I think, are super dynamic. Their offensive line is subpar. Their, 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 their quarterback throws a nice ball but doesn't move well and isn't particularly tough. Their wide receivers are dynamic but not super fast. It's not a fast offense. Um, I think it's going to be a low-scoring game, and if the Niners commit to the run, control the clock, they should be the better running team in this game. Their run game should be more efficient. They should run for more yards than the Rams. And if they can get anything out of their passing game and Emmanuel Mosley plays like Emmanuel Mosley and Jason Verrett can stick, stick through the whole game, then I think the Niners can win this one like like 20 to 17 or, or 20 to 19, something like that. Um, but I'm going to pick them to win in a blowout, 40 to 9, because every time I pick them to win in a blowout, they lose. And I'm going to keep doing that until someone on the 49ers pays me $2 million. I'm holding the team up for ransom. You want to stop losing? Someone pay me off. I'll quit. I'll go move to Hawaii or Fiji and live a nice life. Um, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to pick the Niners to win by 35. And I'm giving you guys fair warning. It's Thursday. Okay? <laughs> it's Thursday. What, the, what this Niners need, team needs is me to pick them to lose. They've been waiting for that. And I haven't done it all season because last year I picked them to go six and 10 and they were so, because clearly it's all about me. The universe revolves around me and everything I do has an impact on the 49ers. So guys pay me $2 million by Saturday and, and, and we'll be fine until then I'm holding you guys for ransom. I think that's the professional thing to do. I think everyone in my position would do the same guys. I'm doing the same. What? I'm doing yeah. the same because Grant, every game I went to at Levi stadium last season, the 49ers won. <laughs> the games I didn't go to was Atlanta and Seattle, but every game I went to, they won. They're really not going to go zero and four at home, are they? Are they going to go zero and four at home? That's another reason why that it's like tough. I mean, you couldn't beat you, you couldn't beat a Eagles team that went cross country. You're, what's a Rams team that's like essentially like a bus ride up? What what are they going to? They're not going to feel no repercussions. I mean, it's not like Levi has was that much of a home field advantage, anyways. Niners by thirty five is going to happen, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. This was a great one. Uh, we'll be back. I do this every day. We'll be back tomorrow. And this crew will be back next Thursday. This is the Thursday crew. So see you guys in a week.